planes of correspondence. As above, so below, as below, so above. The Kybalian. The great second hermetic principle embodies the truth that there is a harmony, agreement, and correspondence between the several planes of manifestation, life and being. This truth is a truth because all that is included in the universe emanates from the same source, and the same laws, principles, and characteristics apply to each unit, or combination of units, of activity, as each manifests its own phenomena upon its own plane. For the purpose of convenience of thought and study, the Hermetic philosophy considers that the universe may be divided into three great classes of phenomena, known as the three great planes, namely 1. The Great Physical Plane 2. The Great Mental Plane 3. The Great Spiritual Plane These divisions are more or less artificial and arbitrary for the truth is that all of the three divisions are but ascending degrees of the great scale of life, the lowest point of which is undifferentiated matter, and the highest point that of spirit. And, moreover, the different planes shade into each other, so that no hard and fast division may be made between the higher phenomena of the physical and the lower of the mental, or between the higher of the mental and the lower of the physical. In short, the three great planes may be regarded as three great groups of degrees of life manifestation. While the purposes of this little book do not allow us to enter into an extended discussion of, or explanation of, the subject of these different planes, still we think it well to give a general description of the same at this point. At the beginning we may as well consider the question so often asked by the neophyte, who desires to be informed regarding the meaning of the word plane, which term has been very freely used, and very poorly explained, in many recent works upon the subject of occultism. The question is generally about as follows, is a plane a place having dimensions, or is it merely a condition or state? We answer, no, not a place, nor ordinary dimension of space, and yet more than a state or condition. It may be considered as a state or condition, and yet the state or condition is a degree of dimension, in a scale subject to measurement. Somewhat paradoxical, is it not? But let us examine the matter. A dimension, you know, is a measure in a straight line, relating to measure, etc. The ordinary dimensions of space are length, breadth, and height, or perhaps length, breadth, height, thickness, or circumference. But there is another dimension of created things or measure in a straight line, known to occultists, and to scientists as well, although the latter have not as yet applied the term dimension to it and this new dimension, which, by the way, is the much speculated about fourth dimension, is the standard used in determining the degrees or planes. This fourth dimension may be called the dimension of vibration it is a fact well known to modern science, as well as to the hermetists who have embodied the truth in their third hermetic principle, that everything is in motion, everything vibrates, nothing is at rest. From the highest manifestation, to the lowest, everything and all things vibrate. Not only do they vibrate at different rates of motion, but as in different directions and in a different manner. The degrees of the rate of vibrations constitute the degrees of measurement on the scale of vibrations, in other words the degrees of the fourth dimension. And these degrees form what occultists call planes the higher the degree of rate of vibration, the higher the plane, and the higher the manifestation of life occupying that plane. So that while a plane is not a place, nor yet a state or condition, yet it possesses qualities common to both. We shall have more to say regarding the subject of the scale of vibrations in our next lessons, in which we shall consider the hermetic principle of vibration. You will kindly remember, however, that the three great planes are not actual divisions of the phenomena of the universe, but merely arbitrary terms used by the hermetists in order to aid in the thought and study of the various degrees and forms of universal activity in life. The atom of matter, the unit of force, the mind of man, and the being of the archangel are all but degrees in one scale, and all fundamentally the same, the difference between solely a matter of degree and rate of vibration all are creations of the all and have their existence solely within the infinite mind of the all. The Hermetists subdivide each of the three great planes into seven minor planes, and each of these latter are also subdivided into seven subplanes, 
all divisions being more or less arbitrary, shading into each other, and adopted merely for convenience of scientific study and thought. The great physical plane, and its seven minor planes, is that division of the phenomena of the universe which includes all that relates to physics, or material things, forces, and manifestations. It includes all forms of that which we call matter, and all forms of that which we call energy or force. But you must remember that the Hermetic philosophy does not recognize matter as a thing in itself, or as having a separate existence even in the mind of the all. The teachings are that matter is but a form of energy, that, that is, energy at a low rate of vibrations of a certain kind. And accordingly the Hermetists classify matter under the head of energy, and give to it three of the seven minor planes of the great physical plane. These seven minor physical planes are as follows. 1. The plane of matter, A, 2. The plane of matter, B, 3. The plane of matter, C, 4. The plane of ethereal substance, 5. The plane of energy, A, 6. The plane of energy, B, 7. The plane of energy, C, the plane of matter, A, comprises the forms of matter in its form of solids, liquids, and gases, as generally recognized by the textbooks on physics. The plane of matter, B, comprises certain higher and more subtle forms of matter of the existence of which modern science is but now recognizing, the phenomena of radiant matter, in its phases of radium, etc., belonging to the lower subdivision of this minor plane. The plane of matter, C, comprises forms of the most subtle and tenuous matter the existence of which is not suspected by ordinary scientists. The plane of ethereal substance comprises that which science speaks of as the ether, a substance of extreme tenuity and elasticity, pervading all universal space, and acting as a medium for the transmission of waves of energy, such as light, heat, electricity, etc. This ethereal substance forms a connecting link between matter, so-called, and energy, and partakes of the nature of each. The Hermetic teachings, however, instruct that this plane has seven subdivisions, as have all of the minor planes, and that in fact there are seven ethers, instead of but one. Next above the plane of ethereal substance comes the plane of energy, A, which comprises the ordinary forms of energy known to science, its seven subplanes being, respectively, heat, light, magnetism, electricity, and attraction, including gravitation, cohesion, chemical affinity, etc., and several other forms of energy indicated by scientific experiments but not as yet named or classified. The plane of energy, B, comprises seven subplanes of higher forms of energy not as yet discovered by science, but which have been called nature's finer forces and which are called into operation in manifestations of certain forms of mental phenomena, and by which such phenomena becomes possible. The plane of energy, C, comprises seven subplanes of energy so highly organized that it bears many of the characteristics of life, but which is not recognized by the minds of men on the ordinary plane of development, being available for the use on beings of the spiritual plane alone, such energy is unthinkable to ordinary man, and may be considered almost as the divine power. The beings employing the same are as gods compared even to the highest human types known to us. The great mental plane comprises those forms of living things known to us in ordinary life, as well as certain other forms not so well known except to the occultist. The classification of the seven minor mental planes is more or less satisfactory and arbitrary, unless accompanied by elaborate explanations which are foreign to the purpose of this particular work, but we may as well mention them. They are as follows. 1. The Plane of Mineral Mind 2 the plane of elemental mind, A, 3. The plane of plant mind, 4. The plane of elemental mind, B, 5. The plane of animal mind, 6. The plane of elemental mind, C, 7. The plane of human mind. The plane of mineral mind comprises the states or conditions of the units or entities, or groups and combinations of the same which animate the forms known to us as minerals, chemicals, etc. These entities must not be confounded with the molecules, atoms and corpuscles themselves, the latter being merely the material bodies or forms of these entities, just as a man's body is but his material form and not himself. 
These entities may be called souls in one sense, and are living beings of a low degree of development, life, and mind, just a little more than the units of living energy which comprise the higher subdivisions of the highest physical plane. The average mind does not generally attribute the possession of mind, soul, or life, to the mineral kingdom, but all occultists recognize the existence of the same, and modern science is rapidly moving forward to the point of view of the hermetic, in this respect. The molecules, atoms and corpuscles have their loves and hates, likes and dislikes, attractions and repulsions, affinities and non-affinities, etc., and some of the more daring of modern scientific minds have expressed the opinion that the desire and will, emotions and feelings, of the atoms differ only in degree from those of men. We have no time or space to argue this matter here. All occultists know it to be a fact, and others are referred to some of the more recent scientific works for outside corroboration. There are the usual seven subdivisions to this plane. The plane of elemental mind, A, comprises the state or condition and degree of mental and vital development of a class of entities unknown to the average man, but recognized to occultists. They are invisible to the ordinary senses of man, but, nevertheless, exist and play their part of the drama of the universe. Their degree of intelligence is between that of the mineral and chemical entities on the one hand, and of the entities of the plant kingdom on the other. There are seven subdivisions to this plane, also. The plane of plant mind, in its seven subdivisions, comprises the states or conditions of the entities comprising the kingdoms of the plant world, the vital and mental phenomena of which is fairly well understood by the average intelligent person, many new and interesting scientific works regarding mind and life and plants having been published during the last decade. Plants have life, mind and souls, as well as have the animals, man, and superman. The plane of elemental mind, B, in its seven subdivisions, comprises the states and conditions of a higher form of elemental or unseen entities, playing their part in the general work of the universe, the mind and life of which form a part of the scale between the plane of plant mind and the plane of animal mind, the entities partaking of the nature of both. The plane of animal mind, in its seven subdivisions, comprises the states and conditions of the entities, beings, or souls, animating the animal forms of life, familiar to us all. It is not necessary to go into details regarding this kingdom or plane of life, for the animal world is as familiar to us as is our own. The plane of elemental mind, see, in its seven subdivisions, comprises those entities or beings, invisible as are all such elemental forms, which partake of the nature of both animal and human life in a degree and in certain combinations. The highest forms are semi-human in intelligence. The plane of human mind, in its seven subdivisions, comprises those manifestations of life and mentality which are common to man, in his various grades, degrees, and divisions. In this connection, we wish to point out the fact that the average man of today occupies but the fourth subdivision of the plane of human mind and only the most intelligent have crossed the borders of the fifth subdivision. It has taken the race millions of years to reach this stage, and it will take many more years for the race to move on to the sixth and seventh subdivisions, and beyond. But, remember, that there have been races before us which have passed through these degrees, and then on to higher planes. Our own race is the fifth, with stragglers from the fourth, which has set foot upon the path. And, then there are a few advanced souls of our own race who have outstripped the masses and who have passed on to the sixth and seventh subdivision and some few beings still further on. The man of the sixth subdivision will be the superman, he of the seventh will be the overman. In our consideration of the seven minor mental planes, we have merely referred to the three elementary planes in a general way. We do not wish to go into this subject in detail in this work, for it does not belong to this part of the general philosophy and teachings. But we may say this much, in order to give you a little clearer idea of the relations of these planes to the more familiar ones, the elementary planes bear the same relation to the planes of mineral, plant, animal and human mentality in life that the black keys on the piano do to the white keys. The white keys are sufficient to produce music, but there are certain scales, melodies, and harmonies in which the black keys play their part, and in which their presence is necessary. 
They are also necessary as connecting links of soul condition, entity states, etc., between the several other planes, certain forms of development being attained therein, this last fact giving to the reader who can read between the lines a new light upon the processes of evolution, and a new key to the secret door of the leaps of life between kingdom and kingdom. The great kingdoms of elementals are fully recognized by all occultists, and the esoteric writings are full of mention of them. The readers of Bulwer's Sononi and similar tales will recognize the entities inhabiting these planes of life. Passing on from the great mental plane to the great spiritual plane, what shall we say? How can we explain these higher states of being, life and mind, to minds as yet unable to grasp and understand the higher subdivisions of the plane of human mind? The task is impossible. We can speak only in the most general terms. How may light be described to a man born blind, how sugar, to a man who has never tasted anything sweet, how harmony, to one born deaf? All that we can say is that the seven minor planes of the great spiritual plane, each minor plane having its seven subdivisions, comprise beings possessing life, mind, and form as far above that of man of today as the latter is above the earthworm, mineral or even certain forms of energy or matter. The life of these beings so far transcends ours, that we cannot even think of the details of the same, their minds so far transcend ours, that to them we scarcely seem to think, and our mental processes seem almost akin to material processes, the matter of which their forms are composed is of the highest planes of matter, nay, some are even said to be clothed in pure energy. What may be said of such beings? On the seven minor planes of the great spiritual plane exist beings of whom we may speak as angels, archangels, demigods. On the lower minor planes dwell those great souls whom we call masters and adepts. Above them come the great hierarchies of the angelic hosts, unthinkable to man, and above those come those who may without irreverence be called the gods, so high in the scale of being are they, their being, intelligence and power being akin to those attributed by the races of men to their conceptions of deity. These beings are beyond even the highest flights of the human imagination, the word divine being the only one applicable to them. Many of these beings, as well as the angelic host, take the greatest interest in the affairs of the universe and play an important part in its affairs. These unseen divinities and angelic helpers extend their influence freely and powerfully in the process of evolution and cosmic progress. Their occasional intervention and assistance in human affairs have led to the many legends, beliefs, religions and traditions of the race, past and present. They have superimposed their knowledge and power upon the world, again and again, all under the law of the all, of course. But, yet, even the highest of these advanced beings exist merely as creations of, and in, the mind of the all, and are subject to the cosmic processes and universal laws. They are still mortal. We may call them gods if we like, but still they are but the elder brethren of the race, the advanced souls who have outstripped their brethren, and who have foregone the ecstasy of absorption by the all, in order to help the race on its upward journey along the path. But, they belong to the universe, and are subject to its conditions, they are mortal, and their plane is below that of absolute spirit. Only the most advanced hermitists are able to grasp the inner teachings regarding the state of existence, and the powers manifested on the spiritual planes. The phenomena is so much higher than that of the mental planes that a confusion of ideas would surely result from an attempt to describe the same. Only those whose minds have been carefully trained along the lines of the hermetic philosophy for years, yes, those who have brought with them from other incarnations the knowledge acquired previously, can comprehend just what is meant by the teaching regarding these spiritual planes. And much of these inner teachings is held by the hermetists as being too sacred, important and even dangerous for general public dissemination. The intelligent student may recognize what we mean by this when we state that the meaning of spirit as used by the hermetists is akin to living power, animated force, inner essence, essence of life, etc., which meaning must not be confounded with that usually and commonly employed in connection with the term, i.e., religious, ecclesiastical, spiritual, ethereal, holy, etc., etc. To occultists the word spirit is used in the sense of the animating principle, carrying with it the idea of power, living energy, mystic force, etc. 
and occultists know that that which is known to them as spiritual power may be employed for evil as well as good ends, in accordance with the principle of polarity, a fact which has been recognized by the majority of religions in their conceptions of Satan, Beelzebub, the devil, Lucifer, fallen angels, etc. And so the knowledge regarding these planes has been kept in the Holy of Holies in all esoteric fraternities and occult orders, in the secret chamber of the temple. But this may be said here, that those who have attained high spiritual powers and have misused them, have a terrible fate in store for them, and the swing of the pendulum of rhythm will inevitably swing them back to the furthest extreme of material existence, from which point they must retrace their steps spiritward, along the weary rounds of the path, but always with the added torture of having always with them a lingering memory of the heights from which they fell owing to their evil actions. The legends of the fallen angels have a basis in actual facts, as all advanced occultists know. The striving for selfish power on the spiritual planes inevitably results in the selfish soul losing its spiritual balance and falling back as far as it had previously risen. But to even such a soul, the opportunity of a return is given, and such souls make the return journey, paying the terrible penalty according to the invariable law. In conclusion we would again remind you that according to the principle of correspondence, which embodies the truth, as above so below, as below, so above, all of the seven hermetic principles are in full operation on all of the many planes, physical, mental and spiritual. The principle of mental substance of course applies to all the planes, for all are held in the mind of the all. The principle of correspondence manifests in all, for there is a correspondence, harmony and agreement between the several planes. The principle of vibration manifests on all planes, in fact the very differences that go to make the planes arise from vibration, as we have explained. The principle of polarity manifests on each plane, the extremes of the poles being apparently opposite and contradictory. The principle of rhythm manifests on each plane, the movement of the phenomena having its ebb and flow, rise and flow, incoming and outgoing. The principle of cause and effect manifests on each plane, every effect having its cause and every cause having its effect. The principle of gender manifests on each plane, the creative energy being always manifest and operating along the lines of its masculine and feminine aspects. As above so below, as below, so above. This centuries-old hermetic axiom embodies one of the great principles of universal phenomena. As we proceed with our consideration of the remaining principles, we will see even more clearly the truth of the universal nature of this great principle of correspondence.